Egypt is full of mystery and mystery, the pyramids, the Great Sphinx. Today, the bust of Nefertiti is one of the most famous works of ancient Egyptian art. The bust is a stylized portrait of Nefertiti, the queen consort of Pharaoh Eniton, who entered the history by a number of innovative reforms, his reign from 1351 to 1334 BC. The bust of Nefertiti is currently on display as an exhibit in the New Museum, Berlin. Experts argue about the queen's origins, which lineage she was from, and whether she was at all, but for ordinary people it is more interesting to argue about the authenticity of the famous artifact. This has been going on since the beginning, with the latest harsh blow being dealt to the defenders of the authenticity version by the Swiss art historian Henri Stirlin, who categorically declared it to be a forgery. It is difficult to date the colored bust of Nefertiti using traditional natural scientific methods for archaeologists, as it is made of stone. However, a critical analysis is still possible. Its main points are outlined in Henri Sterling's 2009 book, The Bust of Nefertiti, an Egyptological Foolery? What powerful arguments does the author make? The suspicious perfect preservation of the find. The conditions of Nefertiti's bust being in the ground are believed to have been just perfect, which raises appropriate questions. Of course, there are well-preserved mummies, such as those found there in Amarna. But they were in walled-up burials in stone tombs, without air access, with unchanging levels of humidity and temperature. And the so-called workshop of Thutmos, where the bust of the queen was allegedly found, was in the open air. Obviously, the living conditions of the sculptures there were quite different, much more destructive. Moreover, the city of Amarna, or Akedaton, stood on the gentle bank of the Nile, and Thutmose's workshop was situated approximately 150 to 200 meters from the water. Periodic floods, up to 7 meters high, inundated the entire area. All the items allegedly found in this workshop, including the colored bust, must have been in the very wet ground at the time, if not in the water. At the time of its discovery, the bust of Nefertiti was lying deep in the sand on the very bank of the river. How can it be believed that it had lain in such conditions for 3,360 years and yet remained virtually unscathed? The famous bust of Nefertiti, on the other hand, shows no signs of contact with the ground. The plaster is a rather soft material, so it is surprising that there is not a single scratch on the portrait of the queen. Only the ear is peeled off. The base of the sculpture is slightly damaged. One striking feature of the figure is the vertically cut shoulders. None of the ancient Egyptian sculptures has such a shape. They always ended either with a neck, or were made at waist height or full length. There is a face of non-compliance with the canons. All professional archaeologists keep a register where they record information about the finds, where, when and how they were found. Their appearance is described, photographs or sketches of them are attached and so on. The journals of the Burchard expedition have survived, but they contain no mention of the beautiful and surprising find. Neither do the archives hold the special permission that the Egyptian side issues when taking archaeological finds out of the country. The lack of initial information about the sculpture naturally alarms researchers, but the story gets even stranger. After the sculpture has been seen by the Duke of Saxony, who came to the excavations exactly on the day it was found, it disappears from the sight of scientists and the public for a long 11 years. It turns out that all this time the sculpture has simply been in the possession of James Simon, who sponsored the expedition. Is this possible when it is a sensational archaeological find? There was no CT scan in Burchard's time, but there is now, and it clarifies a lot. It cleared up a strange thing. There is a second sculpture inside the bust. It turns out that the artist first worked with the stone, making a blank, and then molded the plaster onto it, giving it more perfect forms. This is simple and understandable, but none of the ancient masters used this technology to make a sculpture. No such cases are known to the archaeology of ancient Egypt. This is the most important argument in favor of just a centenary old bust, as we are talking about modern fake technology. A tomography scanner was used to look beneath the rock crystal from which the sculpture's right eye is made. It turned out that the left eye had a flat surface, while the right eye was convex. It became apparent that the left crystal eye was not lost as previously thought, 
it had simply never existed. The single eye had been planned from the beginning. But it was impossible for Thutmose to make the queen one-eyed, was it not? The tomography also suggests that the damage to the ears was also done at the level of the billet. The right ear of the queen's head, here you can see the work of the forger. He ostentatiously left traces of the reconstruction of the damaged ear, which he only needed to make the damage he himself had caused look natural. By the craftsman's mistake, the ear shows no traces of thousands of years of erosion. The paint seems to have been scraped off as if it were yesterday, a piece of plaster has been chipped off and glued on, which means that the sculpture parts did not lie separately in the sand for more than 3,000 years. Perhaps Ludwig Burchardt's expedition was originally intended to legalize fakes? The Berliner writer Erdogan Ersevin in his book, The Lost Links of Archaeology, is not trivial. 100 famous archaeological treasures, among them, say, the treasures of Troy, now stored in the Pushkin State Museum of Fine Arts in Moscow, he, exposes, as forgeries. The chapter on Nefertiti is among the most modest in this book. In Erchivin's opinion, it was not Burchard's ill will that was behind the forgeries, but his desire to try his hand. How well is he able to reproduce ancient specimens? Ursavan also believes that the model for Burchard was not only the ancient images he found in the Thutmose sculpture studio, but also the German archaeologist's own wife. The author of the book claims that the bust bears the imprint of a resemblance to Madame Burchard. The arguments of another expositor, the French writer and photographer André Sterlin, are much the same as those of Urshavan, but contain much more scientific and historical detail. For example, he suggests that Burchard reconstructed the appearance of Nefertiti in order to demonstrate what ancient jewelry looked like. It is known that he put his jewelry findings on the bust. In reconstructing it, he used the colors he found on the walls of Egyptian tombs. Burchard also cooperated closely with Egyptian craftsmen of forgery. This trade flourished for. In the case of Nefertiti, Burchard, as Sterling suggests, did not initially want to pass off his forgery as the original. But the colorful bust got everyone so excited that the story gained a momentum of its own. In 1913, the precious find was brought to Germany where it was then kept in various museums. Since some time the Queen has patronized the museum island, very effectively, lobbying, its interests. All in all, the Egyptian Queen is a good cause for sensation. As Professor Wildung said, a beautiful woman and a scandal, it always sells well. No one, according to numerous historical sources of the time, can give an unequivocal answer as to who the great queen of the Upper and Lower Nile really was. To this day there is an ongoing dispute between the Egyptian government and the management of the museum in Berlin over the final ownership of this historic monument. P.S. The history of the world is treaty dating and a void of verbiage. Henri Taves